Welcome to my channel. My name is Taiwo Owo Shakin. You can call me T for short. I am super excited that you're watching this today and I can assure you that you're going to learn a couple of things from what we're going to discuss today. Yes, it's a very interesting topic. Are you curious about how recruiters filter the numerous applications they get daily, weekly or monthly? Are you curious about how you can ask your next interview and get that wonderful email that we are all usually waiting for? Or are you curious about how to network in the workplace? Then this session is for you. question I have for you is as a recruiter what are the turn offs from applications that you get like what turns you off when you get application from diverse people misaligned applications yeah. so for example um, screening resumes for maybe a software engineering position um, with the emphasis on Java you know and then I'm seeing a profile that is talking about someone who was you know deeply involved in sales or marketing or business development and the rest of that like just mis totally misaligned that's what we call job spamming does this you happen know, often it does happen like the people um spray and pray you know so like oh i'm just gonna spray my cv all over the place mm. and just pray that somebody just takes interest and just feels that i can do the job you know <laughs> And I'm probably guilty. <laughs> okay. I mean, I think I did that as well, to be fair. And um, also from my own experience, because I mostly uh, recruit for mid-level to senior type of positions, yeah. that makes sense. If it was an entry-level position, you can say, of course, there's God feeling, there's looking at the career prog progression rather to say, okay, maybe this person has the potential to do the job. Yeah. But mid-level to senior, you would be tested on all of these things, you know, yeah. so your functional competencies will be tested to be sure that you can actually do the job. Yeah. So when you send that kind of misaligned CV, it's like, okay, are we joking here? You know, <laughs> yeah. let's have a laugh and move on. Yeah, but yeah. that's the biggest one. Does for me. this in any way affect subsequent applications that are sent to the same company? For instance, I have okay. sent my CV to your company for a job position before, maybe two months, and two months later, I see <laughs> another position that I think suits me better. <laughs> yeah, good question. I mean, then I have to be very careful to answer this. What I would say is for every application you send out, you create a digital footprint mm. and you don't want to give the impression of a confused person. Bottom line, I would say is everything you send out creates a digital footprint. So picture this. Today, I apply for an internship role. Tomorrow, I apply for director. Next, tomorrow, I apply for business development. Two months down the line, I apply for a software engineer. As a recruiter who has access to all of that footprint, for example, assuming I do, it sort of gives the impression that you don't know what the person, you know, is um, a bit confused you know to say it nicely about what they want to do and this person is just like we say job spamming you know just spraying resumes all over mm. the place so when you're applying to particular companies i would say be intentional but only if it's a company you want to really work at you know maybe yeah. if there's some companies are just like let me try you know but if it's a company that you have on your radar and you're like oh this is a great company i really would like to work here be mm. careful you know with how you troll your applications okay i think this is very useful <laughs> <laughs> a lot yeah. of people are guilty of this so you yeah. want to make sure that okay this company i know what position i'm gaming for and exactly. i'm just going to keep it to this and not you know just try to go to a couple of rows just mm -hmm. hoping that some miracle happened, happened thank yeah. you Tristan. and okay so similar to the question the first question the second question will be what are like the turn-ons you know yeah okay so um about the uh, first one so i talked about misaligned resumes i'll come back to the second question i have two other ones i would also like to highlight maybe it helps someone and then the second one will be scattered cvs mm. so some cvs just come into the system looking all over the place like it's i don't I, so I just sometimes feel that 
somebody would not send this kind of CV. So something definitely is wrong somewhere. Maybe something happened with the application. But mm. you basically get a CV. It's all over the place. It's mm. unreadable. Wow. You cannot um, review that CV objectively. Mm. You know, so that's one. Um, a sister of that would be when people apply to, for example, English-speaking jobs in different languages. You know, so you have people who would, for example, maybe apply in their own mother tongue, like yeah. maybe Spanish or, you know, Italian or German. The question is, the job description was written in what? What are the language requirements for this job? You know, mm -hmm. apply in that language. Because there's a high chance that the person reviewing your CV does not speak that language. So if they don't speak that language, that's your mother tongue, how would they be able to review that CV? I think so, this is particularly for people that are applying in Europe. In Europe, there are exactly. So many languages in yes. Europe. Yeah, in Europe. Yeah, I mean, I was quite surprised, you know, about that. You know, that okay, I'm recruiting Australian CVs for an English speaking role, and I'm getting resumes in different languages. And I'm like, okay, I don't speak. It would be great if I could speak all of these <laughs> languages, but at this point, I don't. <laughs> so, what do I do? Yeah. I cannot review the CV, yeah. you know. So, that's one. And then the last one will be um, look and feel. And that would take me into mm. talking about the things I like to see in a resume. Mm. So look and feel, that's huge. You know how you see a CV and you're just like, oh, I want to talk to this person. Oh, you wow. can actually give that impression from your presentation. So the CV is well arranged. You know, you cross your T's like we say, you dot your, um, put your full stops where they're supposed to be, ideally. Because this is what you do on the computer, but you'll yeah. be surprised. You know, sometimes you have people with different types of presentation. So bottom line, look and feel, great presentation is really good. The opposite of that is not really nice, you know, to mm. review because it gives already a negative first impression. And one tip on that is when you're applying, I think we're going to come to that, but I could just chime in now. Um, try to use an ATS optimized template. That's super important. A lot of these ATS optimized templates come with a very good look and feel. Mm. You know, so when it's imported into the ATS, you know, depending on the company, you know, whatever ATS they're using, it just brings out all of those things that you're putting on okay. on your CV very well. So that's one. And then the second one on that, you know, what I like to see would be some sort of personalization. Now, this is very subjective. Recruiters are different. We all look for different things. I, I see people say different stuff, particularly on LinkedIn, and condemn, you know, and sort of talk as if it's a silver bullet. And in my head, I'm thinking, but oh, that's not a problem. If I'm reviewing a CV like that, I'll be like, great job, you know, but we are all different, basically. So this is me. Um, and so back to the point personalization okay. like bringing your unique self to the cv mm. you know what is that thing about you that is unique for some people it would be creativity you know but be careful don't <laughs> don't do any weird kind of thing yeah. <laughs> you know like maybe put your cv in you know all the colors of the rainbow i mean that's a bit too much but something that you know is personal to you and one thing that might be would be your motivation that you could Put into your profile or your cover letter, but yeah. only if you're a career changer, yeah. you know, where you talk about the reason why you want to um, pivot, for example, into that industry and the transferable skills that you bring to the table. So oh. there's a way you can present that. And then finally, of course, would be um, aligned CV. Oh, that's so beautiful to see. Mm -hmm. So I'm <laughs> um, like, again, using the example of the software engineer. I'm screening for a software engineer and I look at your CV and all I see is your software engineering experience, well arranged, you know, and, you know, all of that just shouts out to me through the CV. That's beautiful. I want to put you in front of my hiring manager. I'm like, yeah, you know, let's talk to this person. Mm. So that's it. I think it's important to just know that there's a human somewhere reviewing yes, the CV. Yes. And they yeah. want to see that you know what you're doing. It's properly arranged. It yeah. looks good on to the eyes. Exactly. Right? Yeah. I mean, just on this that you mentioned, I, I know that some people have the, of the mindset that you shouldn't put your picture in your ah, CV. Okay. Some others are like, why not go for it? Mm -hmm. What do you think? <laughs> well, good question. Um, and again, it's not a silver bullet, no right or wrong answer. In Germany, when I came here, I realized that the sort of, gold standard silent gold standard was to put your picture on your cv mm. but some people would say i don't want to do that 
I like it. I put my picture on my CV. And the reason why I sort of support that is because it has a way of making your CV look alive. I don't know if that makes any sense okay. or friendly. Mm. And people already see you before they see you, mm. you know. So if you look at my CV, for example, I think the picture I have on my CV is one where I'm smiling. It's not a very, like, um, you know, all suited up type of serious passport. corporate look. <laughs> no, 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 no. I don't do passport. <laughs> I do picture. <laughs> yeah. You know, so that already, um, yeah, I think it, it just makes the profile look more friendly, you mm -hmm. know, otherwise black and white may be a bit boring. But okay. yeah, if you, if you don't mind, I would say um, on the side of put your picture, why not? Okay. Thank you. I mean, <laughs> well, I think done. the second question is, you've probably answered in the course of this, because I was going to ask you, or the third question, whether how can a candidate strategically position themselves uh -huh. to stand out? Mm -hmm. You know, because you guys get a lot of applications. Yes. So yes. how was my application? What would make my application stand out from the numerous applications that you get? Yeah. So like you said, it's related. I would, again, just to reiterate, apply to aligned jobs. Particularly if mm -hmm. it's your mid, um, gone in for a mid-level or senior, you know, type of position, mm -hmm. align your CV. Okay, so let me explain that. I would try, you know, so that it's not too abstract. Now, we use different terminologies to describe our roles. So when I started my career in tech recruitment, we were called talent advocates. Okay. But I quickly realized that the name talent advocate is not something that is recognizable in the market. Mm. So I would not put talent advocate on my CV. Mm. The question is, what were you doing? I was doing the work of a tech recruiter. You know, that was the bulk of, that was my role, basically. So I was hiring for different positions. I was doing all of that stuff that you expect of a tech recruiter. And that is what the market calls it, you know. So find out the market te terminology for your role and that is what should be on your CV. You know, for example, you know, some people would put, um, I don't know, like I've seen some very interesting titles and the person looking at your CV is like, okay, that's cool. But what does that actually mean? Because the titles have a way of jumping out to you, mm. you know? So if all through your career, you've basically worked as, for example, a software engineer, but you've been called different things. Maybe you were called um, um, application developer in one place. You were called web developer in one other place. You were called um, Java developer. Or I don't know, like different kind of stuff. What is the baseline? Mm. Were you doing software engineering? If you mm. were, then software engineer. You could now put like in Italy, it's internal designation, developer, um, evangelist. That's <laughs> like your spec. But exactly. Then we yes. have the broad name. Yes. Mm. So that's what I would recommend. Align your CV to, you know, recognizable market terminologies. Still talking about market terminologies. When you're listing out your roles and responsibilities, which you shouldn't be these days, because this is the, you know, um, uh, 21st century. <laughs> so this is 2022. <laughs> yeah. You shouldn't be listing out your roles and responsibilities. It's that's not too cute on your CV. What you should list out or highlight or are your achievements. Mm. So th that's what you should highlight and mm. you should add metrics to it if you can. Metrics are beautiful. The reason for that is it helps people relate to the scope and complexity of the work you've done. I'll give you an example. I'm interviewing a candidate and I say, oh, um, I saw that you were able to um, in, um, influence your team yeah. you know or you're explaining let's flip it you're explaining your um position to me and you say that oh you know this feature that i created had a lot of uh, had a great impact on the business what does that mean what how what is the size of the business you know for you can say it had a great impact on the business something comes to my mind but somebody who says um, it had a great impact on a team size of 50 people, mm. of which 70% of the people were actively involved, you know, in using it, a picture forms. Somebody else says it had a great impact on my team, which is um, about 1,000 people, of which 45 people used it. The picture changes. Mm. So it's about scope and complexity, and that mm. is what you get from metrics. So let's back up a little bit. We've talked about, you know, aligned CV. Yeah. You should 
align the terminologies you use to market recognizable terminologies, one. And then two, you should also highlight your achievements on your CV. Don't list your roles and responsibilities. We call it shopping list, <laughs> you know. So we don't want to see the shopping list. We want to see your achievements. Mm. It's not about, oh, I, I was able to... Um, for example, I was able to negotiate with my stakeholders, you know, as part of my roles and responsibilities. That's great. But what did that achieve? What's the point to all of that? Yeah. So that's how you, you list that out. And then the final one, I already touched on it before, but I'll touch on it again. If you are a career changer, it's important to highlight your motivation for wanting to change in some shape or form. You can submit a cover letter. I know mainstream news is that Recruiters don't have time to read cover letters. A lot of recruiters don't read cover letters. You know, I read cover letters anyway. But if you don't want to do that, if it's too stressful, put it in your profile uh, se um, section. So on your CV, let there be a profile section and talk about, you know, what motivates you about that particular field and why you want to change. One or two sentences, in my opinion, is fine. And then the final one, please. Please and please. Somebody say, please. 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 <laughs> <laughs> if you're downloading your CV from LinkedIn, or don't do that. Mm. Don't even do that. Just prepare a CV. Because when you download, you know, you get all these jobs that say, oh, easy apply. Apply with LinkedIn. Yeah, oh, I, I see that a lot. I think horrible. I must have done it before. It looks horrible in the ATS. Wow. Because it brings your CV and then it just lists out like, it's not very nice. That's all I can say. So I would advise that you take the effort to prepare the CV. Okay. You know, a hiring manager actually told me this. The person said, all the CVs downloaded from <laughs> LinkedIn. I don't want to say it because it just shows a lack of um, effort. Mm -hmm. So if you really want this job, if, you really want, if you're really passionate about wanting to get this role, it should already show from your application. And if you just want to do one click to apply, and then we're not really sure we should be talking to you, you know. So be very careful. Okay. Some companies are really strict about that. Some other companies don't mind. But the look and feel directly from LinkedIn is really not that great. Okay. So thank you. Super helpful. Um, now let's yes. talk about interviews. You've submitted your CV. It stands out. You got called back. You're excited. And then it's time for the interview. I think the first... Usually, the first stage is to meet the recruiter, right? In some companies. Yeah, in some companies. And some companies, you just go directly to the hiring manager. Or you get a test or an assessment or something, oh, yeah, depending true. on the role. Okay. Yeah. yeah, but what are some tips, you know, some key tips you would... You know, this is, I know it's like a broad question, but mm. you think it's important to highlight for interviews, either yeah. with the recruiter or with the hiring manager, because it's it's really painful when mm. you get the mail to that's inviting for interview <laughs> and then you just... Flop the interview, not because you were scared or nervous, but maybe you didn't just say the right things. Yeah. yeah. How do you think, you know, we can better prepare ourselves for interviews? Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, that's a whole topic on its own. Yeah. Recently, I was at a career fair where I gave a talk and I, I talked about this, you know, interview skills, basically. And the very first one is communication. Communication, communication, mm. communication. You need to build your communication skills. Mm. I personally believe that building our communication skills, you know, is a lifelong journey. It's something we should never stop improving on. So as a recruiter, for example, I'm asking myself questions like, did I interview properly? You know, was I too fast? Was I too slow? Did I articulate my thoughts properly? What can I do to, you know, learn how to be better? Did I pronounce that word better? You know, what was the flow of my conversation? Did it lack structure? Was I able to communicate? Because at the end of the day, you know, what is the, ask yourself this question, what is the fundamental purpose of an interview? An interview is about the interviewer collecting data points from you. They're trying to find out, can you do the job? Are you the one we're looking for? Yeah. You know, so when you get into that interviewing, so to say, conversation, you want to be able to articulate your thoughts in a clear and a coincise manner. It's not about accent or anything. The basic thing is at the end of the interview, um, my interviewer, are they able to really collect the data points that they need? Yeah. A lot of words might be said, 
we might laugh and do all of that stuff yeah, and it happens <laughs> and you're like oh it was <laughs> great and i was literally laughing with and smiling and you like, know I, I'm done with interview. Yeah. I told my husband I'm gonna get a meal that says comfort next time. Yeah. I just get we regret why. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Happened? Because at the end of the day, they looked at their notes and they were not able to answer the questions that they were supposed to answer to be able to check that you can do the job. Mm. You know? Mm. And there are several reasons for this. I was talking to someone recently, a person was saying the same thing, you know, that you just said to me and i laugh because i used to make that mistake i can so relate i mean mm -hmm. i my husband used to sort of joke that the mistake you can make is to invite me for an interview <laughs> <laughs> if you invite me to that interview oh check God. check check you know <laughs> and then i came to germany and i was like bah bah rejection rejection yeah and i'm like what's going on and then i realized oh my goodness communication skills is zero mm. I'm t going into interviews, um, like, like you know, the t I shared three tips. Maybe I would share that, you know. Um, I'm not targeted in my approach. I'm saying unnecessary mm -hmm. things. I'm not focused on the question. I'm not practicing active listening. So at the end of the day, I take all these details, but the data point that is to be collected is not collected. And for them, it's like, no, this is not the person we're looking for. I think this is why you should look at the role's description over oh, and over again exactly. and let it sink because i remember this was something you told me while i yeah. was also you know hoping to get better at interviewing yes yes absolutely you Stick have it to in. <laughs> a lot of us you know what we do when we're applying to jobs we just skip and we go to requirements and you're like okay i have this i have that i have this i have that i have this boom and then they invite you for the <laughs> interview and you're like okay no mm. when you get when you're invited go back to that job description read the first part the part that talks about what you will do on this job that's so important of course read the other part but that part that describes the role that describes the team that mm. describes you know all of those responsibilities read it yeah. and then think self-reflect what are my transferable skills have i done something like this before mm. how can i show that i can actually do this mm. and then how do i communicate this mm. so of course try to structure your conversation and um to summarize on communication i would say number one interview yourself before the interview if you're someone like me who likes to write write down your pitch write down your thoughts and when you write it down you'll be able to see oh this makes more sense here this makes more sense there you know yeah. if you don't like to write record yes your voice. I, I i strongly <laughs> remember this she, she, she mentioned this to me and yeah. i actually saw that when i started to do this i had better interview you know i even while interviewing i felt like okay i know what i'm saying exactly <laughs> and what i'm saying is also making sense make to me preparation yeah. because you prepared and mm. you listen to yourself and then you're like oh maybe i shouldn't have said that maybe i shouldn't so interview yourself before the actual interview yeah. number two practice active listening don't come into the interview room like a template hmm. don't don't expect it particularly if i'm the one interviewing you <laughs> don't expect me to ask you from the very beginning to introduce yourself because i may not follow that route hmm. and it's not because i'm trying to trick you i'm just trying to have a conversation i'm trying to collect data points i'm trying to find out if you can do the job you know so when we get there i want to have a conversation with a real person not a template but if you're too templatey, oh, I have X years of experience, I have blah, 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 and all of that, that's great. But practice active listening. What is the question, you know, and what is the answer to the question asked? Mm. Because sometimes your interviewer is trying to find out something else, you know, but if you're not attentive in your listening and you think that, oh, they actually said this, mm. you would answer and then your answer would be, you know, wrong. Yeah. Another thing is, if you're not sure about the question, ask clarifying questions. There's no harm in that or repeat yes, yes. the question. I think this is one point I really want you to emphasize on yes. because, you, you know, sometimes people are tensed and they're mm -hmm. like, what if I ask again or I ask them to repeat? Do I, will I seem like I wasn't listening or something? Yeah. So. There's no um, problem with that, particularly in this virtual world, world where we're doing phone interviews and yeah. virtual interviews. It's okay to ask them to repeat, <laughs> but, that, but by the time you're asking them to repeat for the fourth or the fifth time, we need to ask, do you really speak this language? Because I've had that experience. Oh, I, wow. I rephrased the question multiple times until I got to the point where I knew that, look, you're just wasting your time. 
because I would ask the, uh, the person wasn't even asking me clarifying questions. The person would go off and try to talk about and I'm, and I'm bringing the person back. Okay, I mean we don't wow. have time. This is actually what I'm asking. The person is going like this. This is what I'm asking. The person going like this. this is after a while, I was just like, no point. You know, there's yeah. no. I mean, it's no probably point. like what you said earlier. The person had a template in their head already and are just yeah. coming to pour it down. So I yeah. think that's. Another tricky part. That's another best. tricky you part. You have to listen to what the interviewer is asking you. Yeah. And answer. And answer accordingly. Mm -hmm. And then finally, so we've talked about the first one, the first point, um, which is to prepare for the interview. You know, you can write or you can record. The second one is to practice active listening. So understand the question and then go for it. And then the final one is what I would call body language, like being present. I'll give you an example. So I was interviewing with a company some years back and um, it was a block of interviews. So the very last person to talk to me was in the evening. You know, we're doing the interview in the evening. And when she came in, you know, she was asking me some questions I was answering. And at some point I noticed she yawned. And I was like, mm. oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I hope I'm not boring. And she was like, no, no, Tussin, you're not. Um, actually, I've had a very busy day, you know, and, you know, I've been in meetings, out of meetings. Uh, you know, that says something to you. Obviously, this person's attention span. I mean, mm. it's not my fault that he's been in meetings, yeah. but I shouldn't be telling you very long stories. I need to observe the body language mm. and adapt accordingly. Then also pace as you speak. Sometimes, some of us have the tendency to speak very fast. And then we're talking to people who are trying to play catch up. And at some point, they get so overwhelmed and they disengage totally. Or you could be so slow that the interview or the interviewer already feels very stressed. So listen to you know how they're communicating with you and try to adapt. You know, this is something of course you have to train, yeah. which is why during the interview you could always solicit feedback, you know, like, oh, I hope I'm answering the question at some point, like put all those intersections and don't just talk for five or ten minutes nonstop. That mm. can be very tricky. Okay. That's, yeah, that's so that's important. it. So yeah. that's communication skills. Let me, should I add one more? Yes, okay, please. Let me Give add it to one more. <laughs> <laughs> this one is um, quite uh, interesting. And I would say build your emotional intelligence. And I'll tell you how that relates to interviewing. Sometimes, and this has happened to me before, your interviewer may switch off mm. and you will notice. But don't let that affect you. I had, a, I had one interview a while back and I kind of felt from the beginning to the end, the interviewer was just off. Mm. It was just like, okay, okay, let's just get to the questions I have and get it over with. And then mm. we got to the point where the interviewer was like, do you have any questions? And anytime I go for interviews, I always prepare questions. I'm very intentional about that. Mm. And I don't just ask questions like, when are you getting back to me? Or what is the process? I, I don't... <laughs> I will not ask you that type of question, to be fair. Yeah. I ask questions related to the business, trying to understand the organization in more detail. And then I started to ask him some questions, and I realized that he lit up because it was like I struck a chord with the questions that I asked. And he was explaining. And after some, after a while, you know, he began to say, you know, so you see, when you join, when you, maybe he, he, for, he forgot himself. I left that place. From the beginning to the end, if I didn't ask any question, I probably would have gotten a rejection email, I think. But I was in between, but I expected that I would be invited to the next round, and I was. Mm. And I feel that the turning point happened during the questioning. So I did not allow the interviewer influence me. I was able to sort of handle, you know, because it can be distressing or depressing when you're talking to someone and you're trying to, and they just look bored. Yeah. or they look uninterested, mm. you know, or they're not even smiling. There's another one I had, and um, just like, you know, we're having this conversation, so if I'm talking, I'm smiling, I'm, you know, I'm not like very serious, serious like mm. that, you know, just having this um, sober type of look. So with the other interviewers, you know, I had all these conversations and all of that. So this particular one came in and you could tell that this one was, you know, the corporate one with the suit and all that. I looked at his, I usually look at all their profiles. So I looked at his mm. profile, he had a very, very impressive resume. And he came into the interview room with all that, you know, <laughs> swag and the rest <laughs> of that, you know. And he was like, okay, you know, um, blah, blah, blah. you know, I would talk, I would smile. And but he was very you know, that kind of thing, 
of course i also adjusted you know because yeah. you don't have it's not someone who's not given you know that um feedback you also don't want to be too overbearing mm -hmm. But again, um, so he asked me a question and I explained and I said something to him and he was like, well, I find that hard to believe, you know, that because um, he, he was talking about it was something related to handling responsibility. So I explained, I gave an example of a previous responsibility that was committed into my hands. And he was like, but why would your manager commit that kind of responsibility mm -hmm. into your hands? Like huge responsibility. And then I said, well, maybe because blah, 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 blah. And he was like, I find that hard to believe. So at that point, I can switch off that. Excuse me. Like in my, even like in my mind, I'm feeling like, I mean, does that make any sense? Um, indirectly, are you saying I'm lying? Yeah. Or are you saying that, are you undermining my ability to yeah. do the job? Why do you think that um, I can't be given that type of responsibility? But when he said that, I just smiled. I, honestly, it didn't affect me. Mm. it did not affect me i mean that's your opinion it can be hard it can be hard it's, yeah. you have to train it mm. you know it's your opinion it's subjective you know but i would present myself but that's it but i won't let you and all of what you're doing rub off on me mm. so eventually at the end of that stream i got an offer from that company actually and you know some of the things that the person said during the feedback call was you know, this person said that and that person said that. And in my head, I'm almost thinking that maybe even one of the best feedback would have come from that particular person. Mm. Because he really came into that place. Like, you know, people who come in with all this air. Eh, intimidate. That's it. That's yeah. the word. But don't be intimidated. Be yourself, you know. Be authentic. Allow it to shine through. And continue to develop your emotional intelligence. Don't let what people talk or maybe the tone you can tell the interviewer had this very aggressive or rude tone that's their problem mm -hmm. listen to the words pick out the question answer it and move on yeah. it might also be an indication that maybe you don't want to work here one or it might be that person just representing themselves and not the entire company because mm. sometimes people are like that you know and of course do your research and be sure before you join mm -hmm. but don't um make assertions based on one person's behavior yeah. that would not be a good way to analyze so communication skills emotional intelligence let's keep it there perfect <laughs> thank you i think this is super helpful i've been there i've been in a series of interviews where it went well mm -hmm. i've also been in interviews where i just like no, no. <laughs> yeah but i think this is re really helpful and I, one thing that is important to know is that you get better with this yeah. oh you do you do so don't be too hard on yourself yeah. you know you get you go for an interview you yeah. get a positive just tell yourself that it's going to be better the second time or the yeah. next time. Yeah, Thank exactly. You One You're welcome. other question now. It's about networking. Okay. Yeah. How would you say, okay, want to hear from you now, your experience. How, what role do you see networking has played in your career story? Mm. And also, is networking actually a thing? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Maybe I don't, I don't want to network. I just want to get work done and Move get on. out of the place. But, what do you say about Good. this? What would you say about this? Yeah. So I was in a workshop recently and it was on LinkedIn visibility. And the facilitator said something mm. that stayed with me. She said at the beginning of the exercise, she was like, everybody take a moment, Google yourself. What do you see? And we all did that. And she said, if you're not actively building your brand, because networking is about your personal brand. If you're not act actively building your brand, you're allowing someone else tell your story in some shape or form. There are some people, some very great people by the standard of the world who are not on any type of social media, but they have a very strong network. As human beings, we are um, social creatures. You know, we're beings, we're social animals, if I may use that yeah. word. This is one of the reasons why people fear death. You know, like when you attend, I'm sorry to go into all that, you know, um, stuff, but I think it applies here. When somebody passes and people go to that procession and they see that person all alone, one of the things that terrifies people is how can somebody be all alone? This person will have no one to talk to. There's just that thing about people not wanting to be alone mm. because we're social beings. You know, we're beings that thrive based on our relationships, mm. based on our yeah. connection and I the rest agree. of that. So your network is very important. It's important to your career. 
um, you might be someone who says, ah, I'm not really into all those online type of networking and all of that. But I would say that, what about in-person networking? So you go, for example, to the office, you meet someone maybe in the kitchen or in the courtyard, or you, meet, you know you would work in the same place and you meet somewhere. And like, okay, I'm not going to say hi if they don't say hi. Sometimes you don't know. I'll give you an example. Recently, someone was telling us about working in this particular company where she she met this person, you know, on her way into the elevator. You know, they had some type of conversation and then the person came to sit beside her as well while they were working. So she also engaged with him. Um, little did she know that this person would eventually become her boss because mm -hmm. she was looking for a permanent position. Mm -hmm. And then she chipped it in, you know, and that's the power of networking. Like sometimes you don't know the person who has the key to the next level you're looking for, the information that you need. Because yeah. <laughs> no man is an island. Like I said, as human beings, we're social beings. So we like, you know, to socialize. So basically the point here is that um, that way she was able to get a permanent position at a time when nothing was really happening, where hiring was concerned. But they were able to make an exception for her. Why? Because she had a simple conversation. She struck a chord. You know, she leveraged that network. So networking is powerful. Online visibility on site, you know, when you go for events, beyond nodding your head and smiling, take a step further, introduce yourself. If you're looking for a job, for example, yeah. be very vocal about it. Oh, I'm looking for this type of job. This is what I've done and this is what I'm looking for. And ask questions. Also connect with people, you know, mm -hmm. if the era of business cat, I guess, I don't know, maybe it's still a thing in some places. But these days, we exchange, um, we connect on LinkedIn. That way, you're building your network. Yeah. Right. So, um, personally, how has networking affected my career? I'll say it has given me visibility. But really what I do with Dear Candidate and all those posts that I put out, um, people reach out to me, people ask questions. I've been invited to speak at some places. And for me, it's such a privilege to be able to, you know, share all of this value with people. And people basically would take it, use it, and see it work for them. That's a blessing. Mm. You know, it's something that money cannot buy. At least for me, it brings this very, you know, high sense of fulfillment. And of course, you know, visibility has also brought some opportunities yeah. to me as well. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. I think on a final note, the question will be, what advice would you give to entry level people, you know, trying to gain access to a, a new career path? Mm. Or, yes, just entry level generally. Yeah, entry level. So the first one, continuing from where we stopped, would be to build your network. Your network, like they say, is your net worth. So build your network. And if you're wondering how can I do this practically speaking, I would say connect with three levels of people. So people who are, so to say, your subordinates coming after you because you're always one step before someone, no matter yeah. how entry, entry level you are. There's always someone that you can give value to. So connect to people like that. I mean, they're very eager to connect with you as well, you know, and also learn from you. And how that, uh, that ties back again to another principle that says that, um, you you some you learn this something the second time after you've thought it mm. you know so mm. it kind of stays because you teach it you give it you know and then it comes back to you yeah. you're grounded in it so that's one then the second one connect with your peers you know beyond your organization connect with people you know globally that are doing what you're doing you know that way you challenge yourself yeah. that way you know what obtains in the market you can follow market trends you can you know help yourself i'll give you an example i attended a virtual event where a recruiter was saying that oh do people still ask people these days to um you know introduce themselves like tell me about yourself like who does that and i'm like i do that you know <laughs> so what are you guys doing these days <laughs> you know so that's one way i guess that way you find out what are the strategies that these people are employing, you know, how can you optimize what you're doing and the rest of that. And then the final category would be to connect with people who are ahead of you. So your superiors and people who represent where you want to be, you know, in the coming years. So mm. all of that, you know, they all fit into that bracket. So for example, maybe you someday, you know, sometime, maybe in five years time, for example, not too distant future, uh, visualize yourself as being a director or a vice president of something. How many vice presidents are you connected to? Mm. How many directors are you connected to? Are you following them? Like if you send them a connection invite now on LinkedIn, for example, they may not, maybe they won't accept, I don't know, like maxed out or busy, busy. 
But the good thing is you can follow them. You yeah. can see what they're talking about. Yeah. You can look at their profile. You can, you know, identify your competency gap, like they call it, and help, you know, chart your career, you know, in a better way. Again, example, because I like to make it practical. Um, it might happen that you see a trend that everybody in that position that you want to get to, on the average, has an MBA. So is that some hint, 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 get an MBA? <laughs> you know, you never know. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> so build your network. The second one I'll say is be curious, you know. Keep learning, keep asking questions. Answer, uh, questions and not answers create knowledge. You know, so the more questions you ask, the more, you know, you learn or the more you know, the more knowledge comes in. So ask questions. When you go for events, um, put up your hand if you have a question. I mean, a real question, not a question that you're just trying to maybe show off or make yourself look smart or something like that. No, I'm talking about a real burning question. So ask questions, you know, and keep learning. Keep learning. You know, give yourself to uh, to to you know the discipline of knowing your onions. You know, maybe certifications, um, events, and the rest of that. But Continue to increase in knowledge. And then the final one I would say is be flexible. So you want to get to this point, but there might be different bands you have to negotiate to be able to get to that point. And that's okay. Okay. So, um, you know, be flexible. Be flexible. Eventually what you want would come. You know, you get to that point where you can say, I'm rigid <laughs> into the this or nothing, you know. <laughs> but as an entry-level candidate, try to be flexible you know, take opportunities, learn from them, optimize, and then keep pushing until you get what you want. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Tosin. I mean, I'm pretty sure we've learned a lot. I have, for one, I've learned a lot just by sitting with Tosin. And you can follow Tosin on LinkedIn, um, Tosin Anifu Woshe. You can also subscribe to the uh, Adia Candidate platforms. There are on different platforms. There are also on um, Spotify. Yeah, I, Spotify, I Apple, Google. Anywhere you listen to your pods, literally. You're going to find it. Thank you for watching this video. I hope it was helpful. Please let us know what you think in the comment section. And remember to like, share, and subscribe. If you have questions or something you would like us to talk about, please leave them in the comments as well. Until next time. Bye.